Hi everyone, it's Chris Frame here and welcome back to my channel. In March of 1940, the world's largest ocean liner set sail on a fast voyage bound for New York. This ship, which was to be one of the most luxurious ships ever created, was not carrying any passengers on this voyage. Uh, and in fact, she was making the voyage under complete secrecy. This ship, of course, was the RMS Queen Elizabeth, and she was making a mad dash across the Atlantic during the early days of World War II. Queen Elizabeth was one of the most remarkable ships in service, and she is the topic of today's history video. Queen Elizabeth was the second in a class of liners, the Queen class of liners, that was designed by Cunard to be able to operate a two-ship weekly transatlantic service. This had been the goal of major shipping lines for a long time on the North Atlantic, to have two large ships. One could leave Southampton, one could leave New York. They'd pass in the middle, and within a week, they'd have transited the Atlantic with thousands of passengers on board because of their immense size. And they'd do it fast, too, because of their huge turbine engines that would allow them to power across the Atlantic at very high speeds, speeds over 30 knots. The first of those ships was the RMS Queen Mary, which was launched in 1934. Queen Mary had been under construction since 1930 at the John Brown shipyard in Clydebank, in Scotland. But the crippling impact of the Great Depression had significantly delayed her launch. This is a fascinating story, but it's one for another video. To enable the ship to be completed, Cunard merged with White Star Line and was provided with government funding to build Queen Mary and a running mate. The new Cunada, the running mate for Queen Mary, was laid down in December of 1936 at John Brown's. Given the build number of Hull 552, this new ship was to be even larger than Queen Mary at over 83,000 tonnes. She was over 1,000 feet in length and would be able to match uh, Queen Mary's quick crossings to allow for that two-ship weekly transatlantic service. Like the Queen Mary, Hull 552 was a fast and powerful ship Four state-of-the-art Parsons geared turbines propelled the ship's four propellers, allowing the vessel to match the running speed of Queen Mary. Now, this ship was launched as RMS Queen Elizabeth. She was launched and named by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, who was the Queen Consort of King George VI. The launch took place on 27 September 1938. An estimated 300,000 spectators were at John Brown's to watch the ship go down the slipway. The Queen attended the launch with Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret, and the ship went down the slipway uh, in Clydebank, ready to start her fitting out process, which would see the ship completed for entry into transatlantic service. When the ship was being fitted out, however, the devastating effects of World War II were becoming more and more apparent. Uh, and by the time the ship was ready to sail, she was sitting there, unsafe, in the Clyde. Queen Mary had been left in New York, and so Cunard weren't too concerned about her. But the Queen Elizabeth, well, what to do with this massive ship? She was within reach of the uh, Nazi bombers, and was also uh, unable to easily escape unnoticed. The ship was so large and so notable, of course. Already painted in her wartime grey, a small crew were signed on board, and they were told to bring a small overnight bag for a short journey to Southampton. It was believed and widely reported that the new Queen Elizabeth would make the journey to Southampton for provisioning before making her way across the Atlantic bound for New York. It was also suspected that enemy spies would be active in the British Isles, and so it was believed that the Luftwaffe would be aware of the ship's planned voyage to the south coast of England. Queen Elizabeth set sail in March of 1940, and when she was in open ocean, her captain opened sealed orders that revealed his destination as not being Southampton, but rather New York. And so the untested and untried Queen Elizabeth made a mad dash at high speed across the Atlantic. Now this ship had never had its sea trials. It had never been tested like this in open ocean. It still had some of its launching gear attached under the waterline from when it went down the slipway. And yet the Queen Elizabeth made this crossing across the Atlantic at high speeds and everything worked. Mechanically, she was a marvel and she arrived unannounced in New York Harbor. And in fact, on the day that she arrived, it was a foggy day and the lighthouse operator at the Ambrose Lighthouse near the entrance of New York Harbor described what he thought looked like a gray ghost coming through the mist. This ship 
this biggest ship that's ever been put into service, arriving painted in grey, unannounced, and for a brief period, uh, during the early days of World War II, we saw the Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mary, and the Normandy, the three largest liners in the world, lined up side by side by side in New York Harbour. Now, you do have to feel sorry for those crew who brought that small overnight bag for the journey to Southampton because some of them wouldn't see home for many, many months. The ship was subsequently called into wartime service and sent to Singapore for a refit where she became the largest troop ship in the world. She was originally designated to carry up to 10,000 people and would do the Australian voyages from Australia, taking Australian and New Zealand servicemen up to the Middle East. But when America entered the war on the side of the Allies, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth were both pulled into that transatlantic service. They were given a further refit and could carry upwards of 15,000 men. Now, Queen Elizabeth's sister ship, the Queen Mary, does hold the record for the most people carried on board, 16,082 people in a single crossing, but Queen Elizabeth herself was known to carry very high numbers of people in that sort of 15,000, 16,000 person category. On board the ship, they had to monitor where the troops were stationed. They weren't allowed free movement around the ship due to stability. They had a situation called the warm bunk syndrome, where you could never get into a cold bed because the beds were in constant rotation or the bunks were in constant rotation. I don't even want to go into the bathroom situation on board. These ships were not designed to carry 15,000, 16,000 people. Uh, so you can imagine it wasn't the most sanitary experience. Uh, but also you have to think about other things like the logistics of food, the logistics of sleeping, sleeping out on deck, being moved around the ship and having to also stay fit and ready for the service that you're going to have to do once you arrive in Europe. Now the ships were a remarkable asset for the Allies and Winston Churchill himself credited them Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary as helping to shorten the war by at least a year. Uh, and this, all, um, coupled with their service as war bride repatriation vessels after the war, gave them this feeling as being part of history. They were national heroes, uh, just like any other uh, major military hero. The ships eventually returned to Cunard service in 1947 and Queen Elizabeth was given her peacetime interior for the first time. Art Deco was used aboard the ship with great effect uh, and she set sail with passengers on board and then eventually was able to do that tandem transatlantic crossing, the two ship weekly service uh, with Queen Mary. Now I'll go into Queen Mary and other Cunard ships in more detail on this channel. This was the first in this uh, history series so I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Don't forget to give it a like if you enjoyed the video and please remember to subscribe so you can see future history videos. Thanks so much for watching and until next time, I hope to see you on board.